Uh, okay, so as it was said, this is a merge talk, but as the two talks, so we are going to present you two attacks uh, against obfuscators, branching program obfuscators, and as the two talks are very similar, they have the, sorry, two articles, share two attacks, share the same structure, we decided with Minky so I'm to share the talk, so I'm going to do the introduction, and then Minky is going to do more into the details. So there is only one talk. Um, so let's start with what is this talk about. So what we are going to present you are two uh, attacks against some candidate branching program um, when they are built upon the GDH 13 multi map. And so they are partial attack in the sense that the first attack works only for a specific set of parameters and the second attack works only in the quantum setting. So, yeah, so the two attacks have a as I said, have a similar structure where we both use weaknesses of the underlying GGH 13 multi map to construct uh, concrete attacks against the candidate obfuscators. So let me start by defining what is an obfuscation scheme. So um, from a functionality point of view, an obfuscator is simply uh, an, efficient, an efficiently computable function transforming a circuit into an equivalent circuit, that means a circuit that computes the same function as the first circuit. And in this talk, we will be interested in obfuscator for the class of all polynomial size circuits or all polynomial size branching program, but I'm going to define what it is later. And so that's for uh, functionality of a branching program. And what are the security requirements? So the more natural definition we would like um, uh, is called virtual black box VBB. And it basically requires that the obfuscated program should reveal nothing about the initial uh, circuit except its input output behavior. So we want the obfuscated program to act as a black box. The problem is that it has been shown to be impossible to achieve. So that's a result of Barak et al. in 2001. And so in the same article, they also propose a new security definition, which is called indistinguishability obfuscation. And so this definition just requires that for any two equivalent circuits, so circuits that compute the same uh, function, we want that the obfuscated version of the two circuits are computationally indistinguishable. So all the obfuscators we are going to describe in this talk are indis candidate indistinguishability obfuscators. So this second definition may seem a bit, uh, yeah, a bit strange because what we really want is that the obfuscated program hides the circuits, but it still has a lot of application to cryptographic construction, so functional encryption, for instance, but also a lot of other applications. Okay, so um, the fact is that almost all candidate obfuscators we currently have rely on cryptographic multilinear maps. And we have only three uh, main candidate cryptographic multilinear maps, which are GGH13, CLT13, and GGH15. And um, the problem is that all these three candidate multilinear maps have been shown to suffer from weaknesses, basically because of the encodings of zeros. And so these weaknesses of the multilinear maps does not directly imply attack on the obfuscators using it. But still, so all the attacks we have on candidate obfuscators relies on the weaknesses of the multi maps. Um, and so in this talk, we are going to use weaknesses of the GGH13 map uh, to attack the obfuscator. So we will consider only obfuscator built upon the GGH13 map. Okay, so let me give you a bit of history of obfuscators, candidate branching program obfuscators, and some attacks. Um, so in this history, we focus on branching program obfuscators. So there are other candidate obfuscators which are not uh, branching program ones, but we will focus in this talk on the branching program obfuscators. So the first candidate obfuscator was proposed in 2013, and it was a branching program obfuscator. But so it, all the candidates we have have no security proof, and this one so didn't have any, any security proof. So after this candidate was proposed, other candidates have been proposed also, so a lot. 
This is not exhaustive, I don't think so. Um, but so they try to prove security of the obfuscator in some idealized model. So where the underlying multinar map is supposed to be somehow ideal. So um, in 2013, there was a first attack against so all the obfuscators previously mentioned, except the first one. Um, so by Miles and Sandrine in 2016, sorry. So which relied on the fact that the GGH map was not ideal. So they were uh, able to attack all the obfuscators, except the first one. So after this attack was proposed, a new candidate had been proposed in a weaker model. So this model captures the attack, and so uh, we cannot extend the attack to attack this new obfuscator. And so more recently, there was a new attack by Shen Gentry LV on the first candidate obfuscator, which works only for specific type of inputs. And there was a countermeasure proposed a bit later to try to prevent this attack. Okay, so let me sum this up in a big table. So uh, the first two lines of the tables are the two attacks I already mentioned. So in this table, we also mentioned some circuit obfuscators, but we are not going to speak of them later in the talk. Um, and so what we are going to describe you are the two last lines of the table, the two attacks uh, in the last lines. So the first attack works against all branching program obfuscators. Um, in particular, it works for the GMM plus obfuscator, which was not attacked previously, but it works only in a specific regime of parameters. And the second attack works only for the more recent branching program obfuscators and for circuit obfuscators, but again, it's um, only in the quantum setting. Okay, so that's what we are going to describe uh, in this talk. So in order to describe the two attacks, uh, let me first describe, so give you um, a simplified explanation of how the obfuscators work. So we are going to focus on the branching program obfuscators, and they are very similar in structure, so <clears throat> I'm going to define a very simple obfuscator, which captures, so not all of the branching program obfuscators, but the more recent one. And then Minky is going to describe you how uh, the attack works on this simple obfuscator. Okay, so because we're going to speak of branching program obfuscator, let me first define what is a branching program. So uh, it's simply a way of representing and computing a function. And so how does it work? We, we have a collection of matrices. So is it? Uh, so let me show you in the example. So a branching program consists of a collection of two uh, L matrices. So in my example, L is six. We have also two vectors, A0 and A7. And we have an input selection function, um, yeah, which, sorry, which um, goes, so the input selection function goes from one, six, so six is the number of pairs of matrices in the branching program into one three, where three is the bit length of the input. And so how do we evaluate? So let me show you how we evaluate, sorry, um, the branching program on this input x. So we are going to multiply the matrices and pick only one matrix per column. So do we choose it? We first pick A0 because there is no choice. Then for the first column, we will look at the input selection function of one, which is one. So we are going to look at the first bit of x, it's a zero. So we are going to pick the matrix with a zero. Here, so this is one, we look at the first bit. and We do the same for the second column, so imp of two is one again, so we look at the first bit of x, it's still zero, so we pick the matrix with a zero. For the third one, it's a one, so we pick the matrix with a one, etc., etc. And so we multiply all these matrices, and we obtain something which is either zero, in which case we say that the output of the branching program is zero, or one, no, or sorry, non-zero, and in which case we say that the output of the branching program is one. So this is it for branching program. Um, so let me 
give you also a brief definition of what is a cryptographic multilinear map. So a cryptographic multilinear map is indexed by is, um, so there is some parameter kappa, which will denote the maximum level of the encoding. And so we will have encodings with levels from zero to kappa. And we want three um, public procedures to be available on these encodings. We want to be able to add two encodings at the same level and get an encoding of the sum at the same level. We want to be able to multiply two encodings and get an encoding of the product, but whose level is the sum of the two levels. So when we multiply, we add the levels, and when we add, we keep the same level. And finally, we want a public zero test procedure. So we want to be able to determine whether an encoding at the maximum level is an encoding of zero or not. So that's what the functionality we would like for our multilinear map. And Minky is going to describe later how does the GDH map achieve this functionality. But we just need that. So now I can define, I can present you the simple obfuscator. So how does it work? It takes as input a branching program. Then the first step, the first step, sorry, will be to randomize the branching program. So there is three main procedures to do that. The first one is uh, adding diagonal block to the matrices. <coughs> but we put a block of zeros here. So when we multiply everything, the B blocks get canceled out, and so we, it's just the A blocks that remains. The second randomization technique is multiplying by random matrices, but in such a way that when we multiply something, so R1 will be canceled by R1 minus 1, R2 by R2 minus 1, etc. and so at the end, we still get a product of the A matrices. And finally, the last and possibilities is to multiply everything by random scalars, because at the end, we only check whether something is zero or non-zero, so if we multiply by random non-zero scalars, it's, there is no problem. So you have these three um, uh, randomization techniques. You can pick any subset of them, and you will get different obfuscators, but basically all the obfuscators, the branching program obfuscators, use some subset of these randomization techniques. And then we just encode all, so, sorry, so we get A tilde, which are the randomized matrices, and we just encode them using a um, multilinear map. And so because it's a multilinear map, we can multiply the encodings, we get an encoding at the maximum level, and we can test whether it's zero or not. So that's, these encodings are the output of the obfuscated branching program, of the obfuscated, of the obfuscator, sorry, that's the obfuscated branching program. So that's all for the definition of the simple obfuscator. So I hope it's clear. And so now Minky is going to give you more details about the attacks. Thank you, Alice. Now, we will see the GG13 multilinear map simply and then talk about the contributions, details, and remarks. GGH13 multilinear map usually defined on the link jet text over x to the n plus one for a power of two integer n. And it takes the plain text space p, which is equal to r over the ideal g, for a small element g in r. Here, small means that g is every, every coefficient of g is sufficiently small. And it's, 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 it's not work, ah, uh, work. <laughs> its encoding space is RQ, which is equal to R over QR for a large integer Q. And we usually write X bracket Q to denote the represent, representative of X in RQ. To initiate the GG13 multinia map, we should sample Z and H, which have a heartbeat size of Q. And an encoding of A at level I is defined by A plus RG over Z to the I. Here, R is also a small element in R, in the link R. Then, it is easy to verify that it satisfies the addition and multiplication condition of the multilinear map. And to check the zero testing, we should define a zero testing parameter, which is equal to some value and satisfy the following property. For a time-level encoding U, 
the product of u and zero testing parameter modulus q is small than the time level encoding is indeed encoding of zero. Now we are ready to see the contributions. Let's begin with rephrasing, rephrasing the main idea. Both of our attack brings the known weaknesses of GG13 multi-channel map into the concrete attacks for the obfuscation cases. More concretely, the first attack suggested by Chun, Kim, Li, and me used the enter attack. Previously, for the suggested parameter of GG13, the underlying enter problem is solvable in polynomial time using subfield attacks, but this enter attack is not linked to a concrete attack of GG13. In this work, we show that using enter server, uh, branching program of obfuscations over GG13 can be broken in polynomial time. And the second attack, so this by Alice Pellemari, used the short principle idle problem server, which is known to learn in quantum polynomial time. In other words, she showed that many obfuscations and circuit obfuscations can be broken in quantum polynomial time. Now we will see the attack in detail. Let's consider two level one encoding A1 over G and A2 over G. Then by dividing them, we can obtain a A1 over A2, which is an enter instance. Then thanks to this subfield attack, we can obtain a CA1 and CA2 in the ring R. Moreover, for the other encoding A3 over G, we can compute CA3 in the ring R in some arithmetic way. Then combining this, we can obtain some kind of simultaneous entry server. That is, for a given many encoding AI over G, you can obtain C AI in the ring R simultaneously. And in other words, for a given encoding of matrix A, you can obtain uh, another form of encoding of A. Yes. Uh, the thing is, every element we obtain this are in the ring R rather than on Q. In other words, we have removed the modulus Q. Now we will see the attack. We take an obfuscated program of P and a plain program Q as an input. And the purpose of the attack is to distinguish whether P is Q or not. Note that it is sufficient to break the indistinguishability of the obfuscation. Then for each given branching program matrices, obfuscated branching program matrices, we solve the entry problem simultaneously. Then we obtain, we obtain a new matrices, which are all in the ring R. And it is also of the form of branching program. Then let's consider the evaluation of the branching program. For the plane, pro when plane program output zero, then obfuscated program outputs time level encoding of zero of the form RG over Z to the kappa. And in I program, it is correspond to multiple of G by some computations. In other words, in other words, we can compute many multiple of G using the evaluation of branching programs. Then by collecting this, using homing number form, we can recover the ideal G and then compute the C A tilde modulus G. Note that C A tilde modulus G do not contain randomness R and level parameter Z and the modulus Q. Moreover, we can remove the effect of scalar bundlings in this setting, but we omit this in detail because it is case by case study and somewhat complex. Then we can learn the mixed input attack. Mixed input attack is the distinguishing attack on branching programs or obfuscated branching program using invalid inputs. Let's see the example. Consider an input function with output 112 and two functionally equivalent branching program. For a valid input, these two branching programs should output the same value. However, consider this invalid input indices, 0, 1, 1. It is invalid because first two indices are not equal, which is 
which violate the constraint from the input function. So for this invalid input, this differencing program may output different value, say A outputs zero, whereas B outputs non-zero. So we can distinguish A and B by evaluating this invalid inputs. In fact, this is not permitted in the obfuscated mode because many randomizing values such as scala bundlings, but we have removed many randoms, so we can learn this. And another effect, we, in the paper, we have learned the matrix serializing attack rather than mixed input attack, which is the generalization of mixed input attack. This used the sum of many evaluations rather than inv one invalid input, but we skip it here. Now let's see the second attack. For every evaluation of output, evaluation with output zero, it is correspond, uh, we always compute the time level encoding of zero product, uh, zero testing parameter modulus Q. And it is a value correspond to multiple of H in the ring R. Then by collecting these many values, many multiple of H, we can compute H itself in quantum polynomial quantum polynomial time using short principal idea problem solver. And then using this, we can manipulate some kind of double zero testing at level two kappa using this value. In other words, we, have, we can learn the two kappa level obfuscated program. The second step is a mixed input attack. However, for the kappa level mixed input attack, for this invalid input, it is not permitted because we do nothing about the randomizers, so it is ruled out. Instead, we construct the two kappa level obfuscated program by duplicating the original one. And then, for a sophisticatedly chosen invalid input, which output some kind of double zero, we can learn the mixed input attack, and then attack is done. Mm. Now let's see the table showing the results. In the first attack, we show that in the entry server of parameter regime, all of branching program obfuscators are vulnerable to entry attack. And in the second attack, many obfuscations over GGS13 is not secure in the quantum world. This table raises two natural questions. At first, how about the first obfuscation, GGHRSW, in the quantum world? And how about the circuit obfuscation for entry server parameter lesion? Actually, we have made many progresses in this regard while we are preparing the presentation. For the first obfuscation, GGHRSW, it is broken in quantum world by combining our work. In other words, at first, manipulating double zero testing and then run the matrix serializing attack. And for the circuit obfuscation in entry server parameter regime, many, some of circuit obfuscation is broken using entry attack. Now we leave open problems and remark. Our attack heavily rely on the time level encoding of zero. So, however, evasive function do not output such values, so we do not know how to attack special obfuscation for evasive functions. And we are really curious about the countermeasures. For the classical attack, it is easy to prevent by increasing the dimension n to prevent the enter attack. However, for the quantum attack, we do not know how to prevent it, and we guess that it is very hard to modify the CG13 to prevent the quantum attack. At last, we give an important implication of the work. Many schemes, especially recent obfuscations, are proven in their security in the idealized model, or somewhat weaker model. But their real construction heavily rely on the concrete, concrete other schemes or mere candidates. However, 
these candidates may not fit in the idealized model or weaker model. In fact, this work we show that this gap can cause a significant weakness of the concrete schemes. In other words, we should focus, uh, we should pay attention on this gap if the concrete schemes, uh, concrete schemes are proven their security in only in the idealized model. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>